If you have over $200,000 sitting stagnant in your bank, retirement account, or home equity, then you're literally losing money. On this show, you learn how to get that money working for you consistently and conservatively. Learn to grow your nest egg with your host, Sean Winslow. Let's dive in. Hey, Fernando. Welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, Sean. Thanks for having me. Hey, thank you for coming on. I really appreciate your time. You know, a lot of this podcast is about, you know, millennials finding their passion and pursuing that passion. And there's two things we know that require to pursue any passion, whether that be you love to travel, love to give back to your community, or, you know, there's just some like passion project that you want to, um, that you want to go after. We know that there's two things, time and money. Well, my friend Fernando here has a great asset class that we're going to get into that provides those, those two things, probably unlike anything else except for, you know, I love multifamily. So I'll be a little biased with that, but uh, it, it's, it's a great alternative investment. So I don't want to kind of steal too much of his thunder, but if Fernando, if you could just give us you know, a quick background of, you know, how you grew up, how you kind of got in, into being an entrepreneur and, and what led you to where you are today, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. I appreciate it. So, you know, I, I'm the son of two immigrants. They came to the United States kind of with the, the old school American dream in mind, right? Go to school, get good grades, graduate, go work at a company for 40, 50 years, retire with a pension. Obviously, that's not the climate that we live in anymore. Um, so while I was going to school, um, I picked up a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad when I was 16 years old. And that's kind of when my whole world was kind of flipped upside down. You know, all these things my parents were telling me, I realized that you know, if you want to be successful, that's really not the way to do it. Building someone else's dream will not get you time freedom, will not get you money freedom. You have to go work out and, and build on your own dream. So, you know, I went to my dad, I told him, hey, you know, I think, I think this real estate thing is for me. And he said, hey, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, but you're, you got to go get a degree. Even if it's going to be your fallback, you got to get a degree. And then he kind of gave me the Henry Ford response where it's like you can get any color as long as it's black right? so you basically say you get any degree as long as it en ends in the words engineering so i ended up actually <laughs> so i actually ended up going to uh university of illinois and, and getting my degree but the entire time i was in college i was actually just trying to vacuum up as much information as i could get on real estate on business ownership on building businesses creating networks and create and and basically building value so reading all the Kiyosaki books, going on bigger pockets and, and learning and just ask, you know, not being afraid to ask the dumb questions, right? Going out there, what is a cap rate? What is a multiple? You know, what are these things that I keep hearing people throwing around as if it's a second language, but I don't know anything about. Um, I also joined local RIA groups and went to these events and basically stood up and, and raised my hand and said, Hey, I'm Fernando. I don't know anything about real estate, but I'm willing to work hard and I'm willing to work for free. As long as you tell me why I'm doing the things that I'm doing. So don't just tell me to go put, you know, door knockers or hangers on, on the neighborhood. Tell me why that's a, that's a successful marketing strategy. Tell me why that return is better than say, you know, sending mailers or buying off the MLS, that type of thing. So as I kind of progressed through college, I finally graduated and got a job with a Fortune 50 company. They put me out in Iowa, and that's when I kind of started my investing career, if you will. I first started on the wholesaling space, a uh, single family home. So I'd buy or I'd put a contract on a single family home and then sell that contract to another investor for a fee. Eventually, that usually scales you up into buying rentals or buying fix and flip properties. So did that, um, started buying the rentals as well. And I, I saw that this is a pretty good way to create passive income. In the beginning, it wasn't a lot, you know, 300 bucks a month, 400 bucks a month. But then all of a sudden, I get two, three, four, five, my first five flat, you know, and, and the income actually started coming in. Um, quickly upgraded to multifamily properties because I realized with five houses, those are five roofs five furnaces, five boilers, everything that you have to, you know, you have to worry about. And if one goes out, that's a huge expense, especially if say, for example, you have a vacancy in a single family home, it's either a hundred percent occupied or 0% occupied. There's no in, in the middle. So that's why I moved up to multifamily. Um, around this time, I also moved back to Chicago where I was born and raised and um, started investing in multifamilies around here. Now the issue with Chicago is that the tenant rights here are very similar to, let's say, San Francisco. 
Uh, landlords, they really get pushed around. Uh, tenants have all the rights. They can live in your property without paying your rent for a long time. And then when it comes to finally being allowed to evict them after six or eight months, you know, they trash your property and there goes, you know, four years of profit out the door, especially if it's a small building. So I was getting really tired of that. And it got to the point where I was just so fed up with these turnover costs because these people, you know, they didn't appreciate, you know, the hard work that I put into these buildings. They didn't appreciate that they had a, a safe place to, to, to rest their head at the end of the night. Um, so I started looking for alternative options. And that's when I uh, stumbled across self-storage. And the main things that I loved about self-storage, the speaker that uh, was speaking when I found out about it, he said, no toilets, no tenants, no trash. And I was like, those are my three biggest issues right now with being a multifamily investor. Toilet the three tenants, T's. Trash. Exactly. <laughs> so once I started looking into self-storage, I noticed these crazy differences between not only the way that income is generated, but also how you manage these assets, the amount of time it takes to manage these assets. And then in the end of the day, you know, the, the differences in leverage, the differences in competitors in the market, and the differences in the ability to raise rents without really shaking up your tenant base. So I got to nine things that I found were much better than anything else I was doing. And here are those nine things. And then I'll go into each one into a little bit more detail. So number one, it has a higher return than most other asset classes. If you look at over the last 30 years, it's also extremely recession resilient. If you look over the last three recessions, you'll notice that self storage has done very well. And we'll go into the reasons why that is great leverage is number three. The banks love self storage and they, they fight over each other to give me loans. Uh, number four, much easier management, a lot less time needed and a lot less brain damage needed to manage self-storage versus other asset classes. Uh, number five, it's a very fragmented market, meaning that I'm not, on a daily basis, I'm usually not competing against these huge institutional hedge funds and private equity funds. I'm usually just competing against other mom and pop investors. Um, number six, which is very huge for me was low break even occupancies. That was massive change in the way that I thought about properties. Number seven was easy evictions and I use evictions in air quotes. And then number eight is a very high sticky factor, which we'll go into in a little bit. And then number nine is ancillary profit centers. So those are the nine main reasons. So let's, let's just jump into it right now. So highest, re highest return versus any other asset class. If you look from 1994 to 2017, which is where most of the data on self storage is, is around those types of that, that time parameter, you notice that the S&P 500 over that time went up 7.5%. Okay, so pretty decent return for not doing anything. Makes sense. Now we go to your favorite asset class, we go to multifamily. Almost double, you're at 13.3% as an average annual return over that, that 1994 to 2017 time period, 23, 24 years. Then you look at self-storage and self-storage produced 17.4%. So wow. an extra 4% over multifamily doesn't seem like a lot, but you got to realize the power of compounding interest, right? So what does that extra 4% mean for you? Well, in, if you, invested $100,000 in 1994 into the S&P 500, you would be returning about half a million dollars by 2017. If you did it in multifamily, that 100,000 would turn into $1.7 million, just to show you the strength of real estate compared to the stock market. But that same $100,000 invested in self-storage in 2017 would equate to just over $4 million. So that 4% wow. actually doubled your return over multifamily. So huge, right? And this is, this is National Association of Real Estate Investment Trust data. So this is, you know, highest level institutional players. So usually people think, okay, highest return usually means also highest risk. With self-storage, there's actually a big disconnect between risk and return. So if you look at, let's say, the, the most recent recession that we went all the way through, let's, let's not talk about coronavirus right now, but let's say 2007 to 2009 period. During that time, the S&P 500 dropped 22%. Mortgages dropped 19.5%. Dropped Multifamily did a lot better. It only dropped about 6.7%. Storage at the very bottom of the list dropped 
3.8%. So very low, you know, 3.8% reduction in my income. It's, you're going to feel it, but you're not going to feel it real bad, right? It's not going to be a life changer. So what I always tell people is, you know, why is that? So the, the very first question I ask is how many, usually when I'm presenting in a room, I say, you know, raise your hand if you have children. Usually half the hands will go up. And I say, if you were forced to downsize from your current residence down to a residence that was half the size, what would you get rid of? Would you get rid of your kids' drawings that they made for you out of spaghetti, you know, when, when they were five or six years old? 99% out of 100 they, most people say, no, I'll never get rid of that. I'll keep that till I die. You know, I'm, I'm 29 years old and my father who's in his mid sixties still has boxes of like little drawings I made for him out of crayons at <laughs> restaurants and stuff like to this day, literally. Yeah. My parents do too. The, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why, you know, we, we think that storage is one of those really good asset classes because in a, in an increasing economic environment, people are buying a lot of toys. They're, you know, buying things they don't they don't necessarily need but they have that the disposable income to spend and they need a place to store that they're not going to upsize just because they have the extra stuff right they're going to go to a storage facility and rent an, a 10 by 10 for an extra 100 square feet so they can put the stuff that they only use at christmas or halloween or whatever it is right so <clears throat> number three best leverage when you look at default rates across all asset classes over you know, the last 10, 20 years, what you'll notice from banks' self-reported data, you know, we're talking Intech Solutions, we're talking Wells, Wells Fargo Securities, what you'll notice is that the delinquency rates of different assets are usually set in a certain parameter. So for example, when you look at healthcare, delinquency rates are usually gonna fall around the 10%, eight to 10%. Um, when you look at multifamily, you're lo usually looking at the 2 to 3% delinquency rate. When you look at self-storage, it's usually 0 0.04, 0 0.05%. So almost 20 or 30 times lower than, let's say, multifamily, which is already considered a pretty safe asset by banks. So that's one of the main reasons we get so much leverage available to us because the banks notice that the default rates are very low for self-storage. Now let's look at the second part of that. Once a property goes into default, if it comes to the point where the bank has to sell, they usually have to sell at a loss, right? So using those same examples, when the bank would have to foreclose on a healthcare facility, they would usually experience a loss of around four to 5.8%. With multifamily, it's about 3.4 to 4.4%. With self-storage, it's less than 1% of a loss per default. So they really like these assets and what they've noticed is that these are assets that they use to balance out their portfolio from the riskier stuff, let's say, like say speculative home building or fix and flip investors, right? These are more risky assets for a bank to hold. So when you get all of that combined, you'll start to see the types of leverage that's available to us. So for example, I am working on a, a large ground up development project right now in the suburbs of Chicago. So ground up, that's a red flag word for banks. That means this is high risk, so we have to charge a high rate, right? This is a $13 million project that we're building. I was offered a 75% loan to cost loan at 4% interest, three years interest only, which then wow. converts into a three, -year, uh, a three year balloon amortized over 25 years. So these are like multi, uh, like single family and multifamily rates that are stabilized are being offered to yeah. us on a ground up development and opportunistic investment by banks. And the reason yeah, why is because they you're know. not getting that in multifamily development. No way. Absolutely not. Right. Yeah. Even, I mean, even when you're going to, to stabilize, you know, go get a loan on a stabilized multifamily, that's right about there, you know, 75%, right. maybe 70% loan to value on these refinances. So huge, you know, huge difference among the two asset classes. So it just makes it that much easier for me to do these projects because I can raise the capital quickly. I can place the debt very quickly. I have multiple examples where we've actually gone to the closing table with no money out of our pocket. We got a hundred percent loan from the bank because they believed in the asset class so much. So wow, really great. Amazing. It's one of my favorite points about self storage is the fact that the banks love them. Right. Um, next thing is, is easier management because there's less people to manage. There's less management overall. Right. 
if I have a 500 unit apartment building, I'm going to need a lot of managers. I'm going to probably need two and a half managers for that, maybe three managers, depending on the size and where they're located, the asset class. With self-storage, 500 units, I can manage as one part-time person, right? Because those tenants, that we usually see them twice. We see them when they're dropping off their stuff, and then we see them six years later when they're picking it up and moving to a different state or whatever it is. So very little work needed, especially once you automate everything. The next thing is, is the fragmented market opportunities, right? When you look at the U.S. right now, there's roughly 70,000, is the estimate, about 70,000 facilities in the United States. So not a lot of facilities to choose from, but there's also a much smaller buyer pool. And when you're going to make an offer on these facilities, you'll see that only about 18% of all the facilities in the nation are owned by these large REITs, right? These big real estate investment trusts, these big hedge funds. Another 9% or so are owned by the next largest 100 operators, right? So combined, you're at about 27%, which means that 73% of the facilities owned in the United States are owned by mom and pop investors where they own two or fewer facilities, one or two facilities, that's it. So that gives that's us great. a huge opportunity to come in and use our superior knowledge to see value add opportunities that they may not see, give them a decent price, but still have a ton of upside on our side, right? This is one of the things that when I tell multifamily investors this, they, they think I'm lying and they want me to open up my books. Our average acquisition cap rate, day one, day one cap rate acquisition across our portfolio is 9.3%, right? Whoa. If you can buy multifamily properties at 9.3%, you basically retire, right? Yeah. Well, where, I, I, where, you'd, you'd, you'd be lying to me if you were saying that. So, <laughs> right. So where yeah. are you, where are you, where are you usually finding multifamily properties falling cap rates? day one cap rates? Yeah. You're lucky these, well, it's changed pre COVID. You're lucky if you're getting anywhere around like, you know, six and a half, six, like that would Jeez. be a good deal, you know? Yeah. Like we used to try to get around seven, but even sevens you can't find anymore. Um, yeah, it's so not, not what'd you say, 9.3, 9.5? 9.3, yeah. We just Ooh. recently closed on a deal at a 12.7, and that was at ask price. Whoa. 12.7% cap rate. And, and, what, and this is a, an existing facility? Right. 800, it was an $800,000 acquisition. It had about 235 units on it. Okay. Um, and it was kicking out about a hundred, a hundred thousand dollars a year in a while. Wow. And how are you sourcing these deals? Is it, you know, straight to seller? Are you using brokers? Yeah. So we use any marketing avenue we can, we can get our hands on. But what we found is that usually the direct to seller marketing is usually the best. So how we do that is we'll, we'll buy a list and this list we, we capture based off of land classification code. So I don't want to bore you guys too much, but it's called the NAICS code system. We use a specific code and it gives us all of the facilities within a, a certain geographic area. Then what we do is we skip trace those. It gives us multiple forms of cell phones, multiple forms of emails. And then what we do is we put them on a multi-touch marketing campaign. That campaign includes text message blasts, email blasts, uh, ringless voicemail drops, um, cold calling, sending them letters. You know, what we found is that our direct mail actually responds really well in the self-storage space. On our single family side, when we're doing those types of marketing, you know, we're getting maybe half of 1%. That was a pretty good return rate. On self-storage, we're getting about a 4% response rate on our direct mail. That's so a huge. huge difference, right? Eight times the response rate. And I think it's just because the type of owners that own self-storage, they, now this is a blanket statement, so it's not everybody, but you know, move, usually they move a little bit slower. It's not about getting a deal done right now. It's about building a relationship over four or five months. They finally get to that strike price and sell and make sure that we have everything we need. Because storage is an interesting real estate asset class because it's not only real estate, but it's also a business that you're buying, right? And that comes with all these other, you know, different factors that you have to, you know, you have to, to really pay attention to. Right. Um, so much, much slower process, but we have this huge seller pool of, of mom and pop and operators, if you will, that are willing to sell to us at what they think is a fair price because, you know, they've owned the, the facility for 20 plus years. They built it for 50 grand and now Fernando's offering them 800,000 for it. Right. So wow. to them, it's a home run. Are they, are they ever doing seller financing for you? Yes. Huge. Uh, yeah. So one of the biggest things that we always push for, because 
when we, when we go make offers on self storage facilities, we'll actually make five offers. We'll make a cash offer. We'll make three seller finance offers. And then we'll make kind of like a partnership offer, if you will, where if they're asking for a price that doesn't make sense to us right now, and they're saying, well, look at the pro forma, you know, you can raise all the rents, you can drop all the expenses. Okay. If you believe that, how about this? We'll pay for half of the facility. You keep running it. And at the end of the year, if we hit your pro forma numbers, we'll give you the rest of rest of the income. But if you don't hit the pro forma numbers, we're going to prorate that down on our, on our acquisition purchase price. And you'll get, instead of make, getting another 500,000, you'll get 300 or 250. So prove yeah. to us that this can operate at this level, right? That's smart. So, awesome. And so the biggest concerns that a lot of these guys have, because they built them, you know, in the mid to late 80s, that's when there was a massive boom of self-storage when it first started coming around. You know, they have massive capital gains hits that they're going to hit. They're going to have massive depreciation recapture that they're going to have to take into account. So if we can spread that out over, say, 10 years for them, now we don't have to qualify for a loan. Most of the time, we don't have to bring much of or any down payment at all. And now we have a seller that most likely sometime in that 10 years will say, hey, you know what, Fernando, I don't want to live this out to the rest of the term. Can you buy me out at a discounted rate? So now our cap rate just goes up, right? Yep. Super awesome. Um, whereas say like in multifamily where it trades a lot faster, you know, a multifamily, somebody will buy it. They'll turn it around, they'll sell in four years, buy it, turn it around, sell in four years, whatever it is with self storage is more like build it, wait 25 years when I'm ready to retire, then sell it to somebody. Right, Cause it's exactly. such a low, such a low brain damage asset class. So next thing, number six, no toilets, no tenants, no trash. <laughs> right. So, what does that mean? That means very low break even occupancies, right? If I, if I don't have utilities running to every unit, if I don't have tenants that are con constantly coming in and causing liability, my insurance is lower. So for example, on an unleveraged facility, if I'm in the mid to high 30% occupancy range, I'm already break even. Wow. If I put leverage on it, I need to be in the mid to high 60s, maybe low 70% occupancy range, and I'm break even again. Right? So when I used to own, yeah, when I used to own multifamily, I had to be in the 85 plus, yep. sometimes even like 88% occupancy to, to be break even. So that was one of the things I noticed where, okay, I want peace of mind. This is something that I'm building to become a lifestyle business. I don't need to be the richest guy out there. I just want to have quality of life. This is one of those asset classes that produces that for us. And the reason why is again, just low overhead, you know, very minimal utilities, no carpet cleaning, no painting, no leaky faucets, no winter HVAC failures, no hot water heater failures, no having to do the, the roof every 10, 15 years. You know, these are all things that you don't have to do with self storage because all it is is concrete slab, corrugated metal steel roof and, and, and sidewalls, right? Not a lot yeah. of not a lot of things that can go wrong in those types of situations. Um, here's a case study of the very first facility I ever bought. Uh, we bought it at 100% occupancy. They were 20 something percent below market value. They had basically no website. They had no utilities running to it. When we bought it. 35% occupancy was the break even unleveraged and 81% occupancy was the break even leveraged. Then once we stabilized it, 28% occupancy was the break even unleveraged and then 64% occupancy was the break even on a, on, with debt on the, on the property. So crazy numbers. Yeah. For us, if we're, if we're above 30% expense ratio, so 30% of my income going to expenses, then there's something wrong with the facility. Wow. Mm -hmm. And, and you're, are you having third party managers manage these? And if, if so, is there like a break even type in terms of units where you would or wouldn't want to bring that in? Sure. So there's two sides. It's weird with storage. There's this, this big gap where below a certain threshold of income, you really have to self manage it or just completely automate the facility. Right? So for example, uh, that Yorkville facility, um, it brings in a little over a hundred thousand dollars a year NOI and that's with no office on site. That's with no manager there. There's no utility. So all it is, anytime somebody wants to rent a unit, they just uh, shoot an email to this, to this portal that we have. It'll send back a lease. It'll tell them what unit they're ready to go. And then we'll just call some maintenance guy to go put the lock in, 
you know, open up the unit for them when they come into movement. So it doesn't take a lot of management. Where you start using the third party managers are on the institutional grade assets. So that Yorkville facility I bought for a million bucks, small facility, doesn't produce a lot of income relatively. Versus say this one that I'm building right now, it's a $13 million project. It's a syndication. So we want to make sure that it's managed by a third party. And when we bring in those third parties, they're usually charging anywhere between four to 5% of gross collected rents or $2,500 a month, whichever is greater. So if you do the math, that means that we have to be bringing in around forty to $50,000 a month gross for it to make sense to bring in these third party these third party managers, right? right? So okay. that, that, that facility will produce probably a little over a million dollars a year in NOI once it's stabilized. That's great. So it makes sense. Mm-hmm. That That's one has a 900, a little over 960 units. It's about 140,000 square feet. Wow. That's a, that's a big boy. Yeah. So there's, you know, there's, there's two sides of the market, right? So yeah, yeah. these big ones are kind of more of like my fix and flip projects. We, we build them. We stabilize them over four or five years and then we sell them off to these REITs. They just have money coming out of their ears. They don't know what to do with. And then on these smaller facilities, we automate them by putting in, you know, these ATM looking machines. There are these kiosks that allow people to pay rent, rent units, uh, buy locks, stuff like that. We'll put in keypad entry and exit. So if someone doesn't have to physically be on the site to let somebody in, they just type in a code. It lets them in, then they have to type in a code to get out, and then I could track who's been in and out of the facility all the time. And then we use management softwares that really help. You know, 60% of our tenants base comes from this, right? They come from our phones first. So if we can have an experience where the tenant can do everything from the phone, that really reduces our man cost. The two largest expenses in self-storage are labor and then property taxes. So we mitigate the labor by automating the facility as much as possible. And then we mitigate the property taxes by doing some very creative things. One thing that you can do is you can separate the purchase. So unlike multifamily, self-storage is a business, right? It's an actual business that you can purchase. So what you can say is, hey, Mr. Seller, I'm gonna buy your self-storage facility for a million bucks. But what I'm gonna do for tax reasons is, I'm gonna give you $600,000 for the land and the improvements And then I'm going to give you $400,000 on a separate purchase agreement to buy the goodwill and to buy the business. Because then the the assessor, they can only tax you on the land and the improvements. They can't tax you on the business value. Right. That's smart. That's very smart. So so now I'm getting taxed off of a $600,000 asset that I just bought for a million. Um, So it's just some tricks. Another thing that we do is we'll immediately engage a uh, property tax attorney and they'll go and fight the municipality. What we found is a lot of the times municipalities don't know how to tax self-storage. So they'll, in their bucket of comps that they'll use, they'll have like medical office building or class A office building or, or retail. And I was like, these things produce way <laughs> different income streams right. Right, with a, different amounts of liability. We should not be paying the same tax rate as say a class A medical office building. Yeah, so that, those are some ways that we can drop those down. Now, the thing that is is most near and dear to my heart is number seven, which is easy evictions. And the reason I use air quotes is because it's actually not an eviction. With multifamily, you're guided by uh, rental law or landlord-tenant law. With self-storage, you're actually guided by lien law or what's called as property law. So what's the difference? Well, because there's no habitation, no one's living in our self-storage facilities, And when they place something into our facility, we automatically get a lien on their possessions. So if you don't pay your rent, now we can actually foreclose on your possessions through an auction process. So for example, I'll give you just a nightmare story of when I used to own multifamily. I had a tenant, we inherited her when we bought the building. She did not pay rent for eight months. She was what I call a professional tenant. I call them that Um, too. (laughs) Yeah. She knew all the little tricks, you know, like unplugging and cutting the direct wire to the smoke detector, the carbon monoxide detector, say, you know, claiming all these health reasons that she created herself as to why she can't pay rent. And it took a long time. By the time we finally were able to get the eviction against her within eight months, when she left, she caused like 20 something thousand dollars of the damage on a six flat. So that was like four years of profitability on the six flat, right? Small little six flat. 
Now let's look at how storage works. You don't pay your rent by the grace period, five days or whatever it is, 10 days, depending on which state we're in. I send you a letter and I say, listen, I'm gonna auction off your stuff in 30 days. So you have 30 days to come, you know, come current with the rent that you owe. In that time, I'm also gonna put an overlock on your unit so you can't just show up, get all your stuff out and say, goodbye, Fernando, I'm never gonna pay you back. So now you don't even have access to your possessions again because it's lien lock. So now technically yep. those possessions are mine until I auction them off, or not really mine, but I have control over them until I get paid back. Within 30 days of sending out that notice, I'm already going and holding an auction. I usually need to put two notices out to the public, usually in a newspaper or something saying, hey, Fernando didn't pay. He owes 500 bucks. This is his unit number. Here's the address of the facility. Let me know if you want to make an auction on this, right? Or make an offer on this, these possessions. Within 45 days, let's say at the latest, that tenant is now out because a buyer has come in, taken the possessions like you see on storage wars, right? Yeah. They have to clean out my unit. So they have to completely broom sweep and clean my unit or else I get to hold their $100,000 deposit as damages. And then usually same day, I have a tenant meeting my buyer of that auction unit to move their stuff in. So I don't wow. even lose 30 days because I'm usually make, you know, you can charge all these fees. Anytime you go to the auction, I can charge an auction fee. I can charge a lien fee. I can charge a late fee. So by the time this person is out of that unit, I actually didn't lose any money in rent and I already have a new tenant in place. So there's no turnover costs, wow. right? No paying $6,000 for cleaning the carpet and painting everything and putting in a new appliance package if they wrecked it. And there's no two months of lost rents from having a vacant unit. That's huge. huge, huge difference. And this is why I, that's straight to the NOI too. Right. That's all bottom line. So it's, it's one of the biggest differentiators for us, or at least in my mind versus real estate assets that have a implied or expressed warranty of habitation versus assets that do not have that implied warranty of habitation. So things that would fall into that category would be self storage, uh, mobile home parks, if you only own the lot, not the actual unit itself, and then data centers, right? Those are the only three assets that really fall into that, that category. Okay. That's number eight. Day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so number eight, high sticky factors. So what does that mean to me? So let's say I have a unit that's $150 a month. I decide just because I want to raise NOI that I'm going to increase the rent on that unit by $20. That $20 divided by $150, that is a 13% increase in rent. Usually my tenants will not move out because it doesn't make sense to spend the $500 plus to get a moving truck, the two days off of work to move their stuff in and out, you know, getting your friends by bribing them to, you know, with a six pack to help you move stuff. <laughs> you know, there's none of that. So usually most of my tenants say, you know what, fine, the 20%, the $20 increase, that's totally fair. Like just keep it, right? Now let's, let's apply it to a multifamily property. Let's say you have a $1,500 a month unit and you decide to raise the rent 13%. That would be a $195 increase on the monthly rent. Would your tenants stay in that case? Probably not. Probably not, no. Right, they're gonna go to another, another unit maybe down the street or even across town that is either the same price or cheaper. With storage, most people, they're not gonna move. So very high sticky factor when we're talking about raising rents. Yeah, that makes that's sense. All, that's all bottom line stuff, you know? That makes perfect sense. People love, people have attached sentimental value to their things. You know, people are just hoarders and yeah, they're not going to just throw that away to, to save 20 bucks. Usually not. And, and like no. you said, they're not going to make the effort to, to move it either. No. And what we found is if we can convince them to get onto auto debit or ACH payments for the rents, they basically forget they even own a unit. I've had multiple situations where we've bought a facility, we're sending out the new owner letters to all the tenants and I'll get a call being like, Fernando, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't have a unit at this facility. And it's like, yeah, Mark, because based off of this rent roll, you've been paying every month via a credit card auto, you know, an auto debit for 10 years you've been paying on this unit. And then I'll go in and it, usually it's just like garbage. It's like an empty suitcase that's in the unit, you know? So it's, it's crazy how people just kind of set it and forget it, especially with, with storage because the amounts are so much lower on nominal dollar terms, right? If 
you put rent, $1,500 a month rent, like you're watching that every time it calls. Right, you're paying right. 50 bucks a month on a unit. Like it just kind of comes out of your account. You almost don't even really notice it, you know? Right. So that's what I really like. And so rent is just one of the ways you can make income off of storage, right? So which brings me to my last point, number nine, ancillary profit centers. So other than rent, I can charge for car storage, boat storage, uh, RVs. I can charge for locks. I can sell renter's insurance and keep a, a majority of the premium. I can sell moving supplies, packaging materials, FedEx services, uh, scanning services, cell phone towers. I can do billboard advertisements, wine storage, truck rentals, you know, private mailboxes. These are all different ancillary profit centers that you can add on top of the rent. So it's almost like, you know, a lot of these books that we read about real estate and about investments, it's all about increase your streams of income. It's not about increasing one stream of income. It's about getting multiple streams of income and self storage is able to do that all within one asset class. So, and again, all this stuff basically goes to the bottom line. That's so true. It's, it's all yeah. about divert. Like we want passive income, but you don't want just one source. You want multiple sources because, you know, just like what we're going through right now with COVID it's, you know, if it, if it hits that one stream, then you're you're you know, you're up a Creek without a paddle. So it's, it's very important to, to diversify that. And, and most of those things you just said go straight to the bottom line. So that's a great, yep. that's great. And a quick word on COVID, you know, what we've noticed is that because Self storage does so well in recessionary environment environments. We've actually done extremely well over the last six, seven months. Our occupancies are up. Our delinquencies are down. You know, a lot of it is people downsizing. So they're moving from a, say a 2,400 square foot apartment that they're renting to maybe a 1,200 square foot house in the suburbs. They don't have an, enough room to store all their stuff but they don't want to get rid of it because of that sentimental attachment so they come in yep. rent a, you know 100 100 square feet from us and i'm sure the uh the ach is helping with that too because we've seen that in the multifamily space where if you look at op operators that have that versus operators that don't in the beginning we were we were seeing delinquencies around five percent um yeah whereas operators that don't have that ach in place you're seeing anywhere from 15 to 20 percent mm -hmm. delinquencies because you know people that's just that's just natural habit. They're not, if it's automatically coming out, there's nothing they can do about it versus, right. you know, like, Oh, maybe I'll wait like 10, 15 days to make sure um, I have my food first and then I'll pay. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm with you on that. Well, in terms of, I guess the circle back when you're, are you, are you primarily focused on the development side now or, or the acquiring existing facilities? There's a little bit of a, a little bit of both. Yeah, we're, we're almost exactly at a 50, 50 split. Um, we, you know, I'm a, I'm a cash flow driven investor. I think that is always important because you can't eat equity, right? No, nope. but if you have monthly cash flow coming in, then you start feeling a lot safer, especially in times like this, right? Where, you know, you don't know what's going on with the economy. You don't know where we're going to land. Um, as long as you have this income coming in, that helps a lot. But because we prepared for this and we have a bunch of cash flowing properties, that also gave us the opportunity to start doing these ground up developments. So right now we're at about 50, 50. Um, and we try to stay within that ratio. So every time, like for example, we have two more ground up developments in the pipeline uh, that we'll do after the one that we're doing right now. But in order for my team to be allowed to take those properties down, we're going to have to acquire another four cash flowing assets. Um, luckily we have five of them under contract right now. So I think the ratios will work out once we're all said and done and the banks, you know, they like to see that, you know, banks don't really like seeing that you make your income off of buying and selling of assets. Banks much rather prefer to see that the majority of your income is coming from stable recur recurring sources. That's why, let's just take it down to the personal level, right? Let's say you have a contractor that makes 100K a year, but that 100K all comes in the summer months versus you have a nine to five employee that makes 100K a year, but it comes every two weeks like clockwork. They make the same amount of money, but guess who's going to get denied from the bank? They're going to deny the contractor because it's not stable income, even though it's the same amount of money. Even if you look over the last four or five years and they made the same amount stable, they want to see that every month or every two weeks money's hitting the account. And that's, it's crazy. Yeah. I mean, it's, I, I can, I can personally, I can personally attest to that when I, 
first got into real estate, I was still, you know, my W2 job in the, you know, traditional investment Wall Street world. And a big portion of my pay was bonuses and commission. Yeah. Well, yeah, I made a, a good income, but like you said, it wasn't considered as stable as someone who's getting paid that same exact amount, you know, every two weeks. Right. And you know, when you go, they, they do the debt to income ratio and you're usually when you're buying a property yeah, and it, it's just a pain. So I'm with you on the cash flow, hundred mm-hmm. percent. I even tell my listeners a lot that, like you said, I pay my bills monthly. Um, if I, if I have a stock portfolio and it, you know, even if you have a dividend paying portfolio, that's going to get you two to 3% if you're lucky, you're not, you're not living off that. And it, and if you got to pay your bills monthly, what are you going to do? Sell, sell your, your stocks to, to, to pay your bills. And then you're going to yeah. get hit with fees. You're going to hit with taxes and you, you need, you need to invest in something that actually produces cash flow and income. Where you can actually live. So I'm completely right. with you on that. Right. Um, so what, what's, what's in store for the future for Fernando? Are, are you, uh, you have plans to ride off into the sunset one day? You want to do some traveling. You want to, you want to build that, that passive income first. Yeah. So first and foremost, our company goal is to get on to the top 100 operators lists uh, in the next nine years. So by December, 2029, uh, we will be on the top 100 operators list. I think it's pretty easy. Um, number 100 on that list has about 750,000 square feet. I'm at 260,000 square feet. And in the next two years, that will probably double. So, um, we're getting there. I think we're going to overshoot our goal. Um, but that's, so that's, that's the goal level for, for the, for the company. But for me personally, um, I'm one of those people where I really enjoy time freedom. So the ability to do what I want, when I want with whomever I want uh, and not be constrained by work or income or anything like that. So that's, I've been working on building a lifestyle business uh, going forward. Right now we're kind of in the grind stage here, but I think in a couple of years I'll be able to kind of start stepping back. We've already been building our business using, um, I don't know, not sure if you're familiar with EOS, you know, traction. Yep, traction. Yep. yep. So we, we, brought in a, we brought in an EOS implementer to implement traction for us. Um, it's been great. We're all, we're moving each one of the owners to the owner's box slowly, but surely. Um, I do like to work. I really enjoy what I do, especially because most of it's just, you, well, pre COVID, a lot of my job was just building relationships and that usually involved getting a beer or two in me, you know, yeah. um, now it's just over zoom calls are so not as, as fun, but still pretty good. You know, I really love talking to people, teaching what I know and, and seeing if I can help other investors grow their value. So for me, I'm the goal is to retire by the time I'm 35, 37 years old around that time. Oh, you got it, man. And you can run off in the sunset, have a few beers on a beach, yeah. like that passive income. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, man, uh, before I let you go, two things. First, I usually leave my listeners with an action item because, you know, just listening to a podcast, yeah, you, you gave some great stuff, but if people actually need to go out and implement this. So like you were just talking about, you know, time is a, probably the most valuable resource we have on this planet. Right. And if you want to pursue something in life, you're not only going to need time, but you need that money. And the way we are conditioned to, like you said, in the beginning of the podcast, to get good grades in school, to get into a good college, do well there, and then get a good job, work, get a 401k or a pension. Mm -hmm. That doesn't provide that. You're you're trading time for money. Mm -hmm. And before you know it, you're old. You may not even have enough money to to live a dignified retirement and life is gone. So Mm -hmm. multifamily, self-storage, I think are two of the best asset classes to to get both time and money. So mm-hmm. if someone, someone around our age or maybe even younger, if they're looking to get into self-storage, what kind of advice would you have? Maybe, maybe three things that they, you know, that they should be doing to, to just make this, make, make this happen for them and, and be the next uh, Fernando in the self-storage space. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Number one is you got to get educated, right? You know, those who continually strive to continue learning, those are the ones that are always going to do the best in life. So read everything you can get your hands on on self-storage. Go and join the self-storage association in your state and just go and listen and just start writing things down and go up to those that you see that are, that are doing well and offer 
to be their mentee, right? It's just like I did when I first started. Go see the, the guys that you want to emulate and, you know, don't go for the guy that's 30 years ahead of you because he's going to have a hard time teaching you what you need to know now because he's already so far, or she is already so far ahead of you. Find the, the person that is five years, maybe seven years ahead of you and where you want to be in your career and buddy up with them, offer to trade your time for their education, right? That's one way to do it. Or you can go the other route and you can actually take courses on self-storage. You can reach out to the people that teach this for a living and that will expedite your process through. That's what, actually what I did. I, I paid for a course on how to learn self-storage and actually paid for a mentor from that coach to help me grow quickly. So that's definitely number one, get, get educated. Number two, you got to realize that, yes, you need money, but that money doesn't have to be your money, right? It can be other people's money. That's what I do. So what you'll notice is with, when you're going to invest somewhere, there's kind of a triangle, right? There is knowledge, there is time, right? And then there is money. Most of the people that have the money don't have the knowledge and they don't have the time to do what you're doing. So if you spend your time learning real estate, you spend your time learning multifamily, spend your time learning self-storage, and you're able to show your expertise in some way, eventually the people with the money are gonna come flocking you and say, hey, Fernando, I, I wanna get involved in self-storage, but I don't have the time because I work a nine to five job, or I don't have, you know, the expertise, I don't really know what self storage is or how it is a better asset class than say other things that I can invest in like the stock market and start preparing to make yourself the expert or the authority on that, that subject, maybe multifamily self storage, mobile home, whatever it is. And what you'll find is you'll have a lot of income coming your way or a lot of available investment dollars coming your way. So those are the things that I really recommend. Get educated, make sure you're, you're going out there and you're finding other people's money that, you know, there's a lot of people out there that they have money just sitting in checking accounts, literally eroding away to inflation. And those people, the only reason they're not investing is because they don't know what to do with the money. Right. So show yeah. them. That's great. I, I couldn't agree with you more, especially the, the education. I did the same thing. I, I, I sought out and, you know, someone who was doing what I wanted to do and yeah, you do some, a lot of time you have to pay for that, but if you really want it, it's, it's more than worth it. And, and it's just like you, it's the traje trajectory of my, my career has just ex exploded because of that. So I'm with you and on what that. I, and what I tell people is it's not an expense. It's an investment. The highest yep. ROI investment you can make is an investment in yourself, not into any type of asset class, not into stocks and bonds. Every dollar you put into bettering yourself will have hundred X return over your lifetime. So it's, it's an more. investment. It's not a cost, right? And you, there's two ways that you can learn. You can learn by paying up front, which is usually the least expensive way to do it. Or you can learn through the school of hard knocks by failing multiple <laughs> yeah. times and losing a ton of money, right? Yep. You don't want to go that route. Yes. Especially if you're uh, like syndicating or using other people's money. Yeah. You don't kind of, you don't want to mess up on the first one because you're probably going <laughs> to lose all those investors. Right. <laughs> well, Fernando, I really appreciate your time. Before I let you go, where can, where can everyone find you? Yeah, if you guys go over to the website, www.thestoragestud.com, you can find all these ways to, to get in contact with me. You can also find me on social media. My handle is the, the Storage Stud, so it's at The Storage Stud or Facebook slash The Storage Stud or LinkedIn, The Storage Stud, Instagram, same thing. I'm going to um, follow you right now. Cool. <laughs> yeah, at just drop me a line. I'm, I'm super open with my time if you're ever looking for – some advice or maybe you have a facility that you need help underwriting i'm, I'm here to help that's great well thank you so much for your time um thank you, Sean. Have, a, have a great one and we'll be in touch yeah likewise thanks for having me on all right bye my friend bye hey this is sean winslow after being in the financial service industry for years and having candid conversations with good people just like you I realized that so many of us are wanting an investment strategy that provides solid returns and consistent income without the bumps in the road. There's little known secret that your financial advisor doesn't want you to know. There is an investment out there that is less volatile and the returns are stronger. Get more details by going to greenbriarcg.com and clicking on the free e-report. And by the way, if this show has provided you any value, then feel free to leave an honest written review and of course, share it with a friend who needs it. See you next week for another great show.